good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are. Uh, welcome to this uh, side event, Gaining Ground, uh, a hybrid side event at the Science and Partnership for Agriculture Conference, uh, being held here in Accra, Ghana. Uh, let me start by uh, a small introduction of uh, myself. My name is uh, Saidi Mkoma. I'm the Executive uh, Secretary and also CEO, African Conservation Tillage Network, ACT. ACT is a not-for-profit partnership organization uh, based in Nairobi headquarters. We are a network promoting sustainable agriculture anchored on the principles of conservation agriculture and sustainable agricultural mechanization. Uh, the network has been in existence for the past 20 years, and uh, this event is uh, being jointly organized by the Global Research Alliance, as well as the Ministry of uh, uh, Primary Industries of New Zealand, together with uh, the CG Center, ILRI in particular. So it's uh, my pleasure again to welcome you all. And... Um, those people online, please uh, feel free to share your views, your comments through the chat and uh, make sure you are heard in this important event. Uh, your views uh, need to be heard and be shared. Uh, the program will start uh, with the keynote address. The state of knowledge and policy efforts to improve inventory estimates and uh, mitigate livestock greenhouse gas emissions in Africa. And this uh, presentation will be made by Dr. Claudia Ant. Uh, um, so the, the talk I'm going to give today is um, is part, um, I've presented part of this already at the Greenhouse Gas and Animal Agriculture Conference in, in Florida, but I have made some very important additions that I think are very rele relevant for our work in Africa. Um, about myself, I'm uh, the team leader of the Mazangira Center at the International Livestock Research Institute in, uh, in Kenya. Uh, we do have the capacity to measure environmental impacts of, of cattle. We do have actually equipment um, that allows us to measure um, emissions from animals themselves. We have chambers, uh, we can measure soil, soil um, emissions and so on. Um, so we have quite a lot of capacity, which I know is not necessarily the case um, in other countries in Africa. And we are also very happy if, if there's anything you can go on our website. If you, you think there's something you could learn with us, just reach out to me and we can see what we can do just to, to continue building capacity. Um, the presentation, at least here, is a, not in the right presentation mode, but you still, I hope, see, see what I'm presenting. So I'm moving on to the next um, slide, uh, where I just wanted to, when we look at emissions um, from food systems, um, Asia is actually contributing the most for 40%, but um, Africa and Latin America actually um, the second. They, they do have 17% um, um, of emissions contributed each. Um, and next slide, please. Oh, no, that's me. Sorry. <laughs> um, when we look at emission inventories, so this, this publication actually shows what um, percent of emissions are part of the, the inventory. Um, and when the countries here in green, 50% of their emissions are due to food systems. So you see that for Latin America and also for, for Africa, we do have most of the national inventory emissions are for most African countries really from, from food system and livestock is often a big contributor to these food systems. When we look at livestock emissions, um, we have the most part on the 
well you chain, which is going to come from the animals, from the enteric emissions, from their stomach. And the other part is really from manure emissions. So these are the two things that when we want to reduce livestock emissions that we need to be looking at. Um, the problem with greenhouse gas emissions in Africa is not going to get any better because we have a rising population, as you can see, um, from 210 to 250. We're looking at least at the doubling of a population, what we're expecting. Um, the, you, below you see actually the, the expected increase in per capita consumption. So we're going from 7.2 grams per capita per day for red meat and milk to 9.4. It's not that big of an increase really. Um, and you also need to keep in mind that this is still going to only a third of what Europeans actually um, consume. So the major increase we're really going to see is because of just population growth and um, not because of that high increase in consumption per capita. And given the per consumption per capita, which is there, we, it is a good protein source, a very effective protein source. And it's very important for certain, especially rural areas where access to certain foods is limited and nutrition. And it's very important that, that people have access to animal products. Um, in regards of emissions, the, we are, as African countries, uh, need to have GHG inventories um, that's required by the UNFCCC's. Um, and by 2024, all countries need to have a greenhouse gas inventory because this is part, um, part of the enhanced transparency framework um, to show that you're taking, that everybody is taking actions to meet their uh, national determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. Out of 54 African countries, we have 35 um, countries that have um, in their new and updated um, national determined contribution mentioned um, mitigation, adaptation and livestock um, uh, for livestock. So this five countries are only looking at uh, reducing mitigation, 14 looking at adaptation and 16 look at mitigation and adaptation. So the important part here in, in the presentation, I even though mitigation is important, we do need to reduce emissions, but we also need to make our, our farmers, our producers more adapted to climate change. And this really shows us by the priorities of African countries. More African countries look at adaptation. And usually adaptation measures actually have a mitigation co-benefit. So that's what we should be looking for. We should make farmers really more set to climate, like be resilient to climate change, but also at the same time reduce emissions. And for countries to, to actually show that they're doing something, they need to have greenhouse gas and adaptation tracking instruments. They need to actually have effective strategies for adaptation and mitigation. And we also need to have monitoring and reporting verification systems in place to show that we're going towards the NDC commitments that we've made. When we look, there's a, the, the strong connection between the mitigation and adaptation again, when we look at African countries and what they name most important for the mitigation and adaptation strategies, I did because I personally work on mitigation and greenhouse gas emissions. So I have it here um, ranked from mitigation perspective. So the countries want to first work on feed management, um, which is also the second highest um, importance for adaptation for countries. Animal health has been ranked as the lowest the priority from the from the um, measures or strategies that we see on the mitigation perspective. But from the um, adaptation perspective, countries actually rank it as a number one intervention or strategy they want to work on. Um, from a person who works on mitigation, I do think actually animal health should have a higher number than what has here because I do think we can make uh, some good gains. But the problem is we don't have numbers. Um, and I will get to this in a moment. So now for having actually a greenhouse gas inventory that we can track our mitigation measures, we need to move from tier one to tier two. 
um, the difference between tier one and tier two is the tier one, we really just look at animal numbers. So the only way to reduce emissions is by reducing animal numbers. And that's not what, we, what we're looking to do. So the tier two actually allows us to use the animal numbers and calculate the intake for these animals based on what they're producing. And then we multiply it by the emissions that these animals would have per kilogram of intake. And there we can actually now track when we are making progress in production and what we're doing on the farm that can actually be captured. So this is why it's important if we want to mitigate uh, for our countries that we move to tier two, because otherwise you can only show mitigation when you reduce numbers of animals. Um, now, when we look at the capacity that we have on the African continent on, on countries that have a tier two inventory or are working on one, and the ones that actually have mitigation measures, we really, the capacity is not there. We have a lot of countries that have committed to reducing emissions, but they really can't do it. Like they want, but they're missing the tools to, to really do it. So this is what we need to work on. We need to give countries the tool, but we, we shouldn't just be working on getting the inventories. At the same time, we need to work on mitigation because when we look at, we want to limit um, emissions um, and we want to limit methane emissions. I will get to this later. It's important to do this as quickly as possible because we want to limit the emission, um, the, the increase of the global temperature. Our lab, uh, Michael Graham and a lot of other people here, uh, Akim as well, have contributed to, to a study where we looked at um, just studies that are there for Africa, who looked at um, enteric and manure emissions. And when we looked, we really just found a total of 20 studies, 14 for cattle and, and only six, six studies for ruminants. Um, they did either direct or indirect measurements on emissions. Direct would be if you have something like the chamber that we have sitting there and you actually put the cattle in the box, the very expensive measurements, or you actually get whatever is the production data on farms. You go on different um, points and, and, you actually, and then you calculate it based on IPCC um, methodology. So you can do it indirectly. We do need to redefine the, the methodology from IPCC for the African continent. So this is why we do need to do also um, experiments, but we do need to know what's actually happening on the ground. Um, because if we don't know what's happening on the ground, we can do as many experiments. They're not going to be useful. We need to be in contact with the farmers. When we looked at the manure greenhouse gas emission for Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, we actually had no data for small ruminants. They're very important. And we only had a few studies that did direct measurements on were cattle done, urine, and so on. They're also like, if you want to look at the paper, they, there is also directly the emission factors that we have, a summary and everything. I just didn't, you can use it as a resource and go and look at it. Um, but I think we just, for today, it's important for us to talk about what should we be doing, not looking at the exact numbers. Um, when we look at how going, are we going to mitigate from the animals, from the livestock and global, um, globally um, and also for the African context, uh, enteric fermentation actually contributes 17% of the greenhouse gas emissions and it's 27% uh, of methane emissions globally. And we expect how I showed that the, the milk and the red meat consumption is going to increase. And now coming back to methane being a short-lived climate pollutant. So it does have a lifespan of 12 years. If you reduce methane today, in 12 years, the warming effects from that methane are going to be gone. That means that this is these short-lived climate pollutants are really something that can help us to limit global warming. And that's why there's so much interest on this currently. Because nitrous oxide, something you get from, um, from manure, that is a long-lived climate pollutant. So that's for 300 years in the atmosphere. I'm not saying we don't need to reduce this. We need to reduce that too. But in the short term to make gains, to come up with new strategies, to make sure we don't have more climate, uh, more emissions and more climate change, um, we need to reduce methane. 
And I know that probably everybody has seen in whatever country you're coming from more extreme climate events. You have seen your farmers struggling, your producers struggling, massive droughts, flooding. So this is all what is, so at one end, we want to try to prevent it. And at one end, we want to make farmers more prepared for what is happening. Um, we did an, a study where we revised all the literature that is globally on, on mitigation strategies, but um, this, uh, there's maybe one or two African studies in there. So you also like, because there's no information, so, so it's, it's somewhat biased and it's biased, to, biased to, to more European and American systems and New Zealand, because this is where the studies are coming from. So the big meta-analysis, we had 40 studies in there. Um, sorry. And from what we looked at, we looked at about 100 mitigation strategies. In the end, we, we came up with eight um, because we wanted to make sure it doesn't impact production of the animals because if I'm reducing production, there's no point of, there's not a mitigation strategy because I'm impacting somehow the animal. It shouldn't be impacting production. So we actually had three strategies that would increase production and reduce emission intensity. So emission intensity is the emission per product. And that's what we really want to look at in Africa. And these are also the, the strategies that are actually applicable for the African context. It would be, for example, increasing feeding level. This is basically make sure that your animals are adequately fed. Make sure they're, they're, they're prepared for the next dry season. Make sure you have conserved forage so they're not losing weight, so not losing milk production. So it's basically just making sure you're feeding your animal adequately or decreasing grass maturity. So, so feed, do your pasture management in a way um, that, that it's not a, this old, really fibrous grass, but has more protein because often what is lacking in the systems is a protein. And the other thing is uh, decreasing forage to concentrate ratio somewhat. Um, you can improve if you give a little bit of concentrate to, to your cows, you can improve it and it should be very targeted. But I'm not advocating that you like half of you, the feed you're giving to your cow should be concentrate here. This is not what's um, actually practical and, and relevant for the system. All the other strategies here, these actually reduce absolute emissions. But that comes to a cost. These strategies are not going to be, unless the tenono forest forages, if we can bring these in and they increase the protein of our diets, of the cow diets, then, then this may be a good option. Um, so we're looking into this, but the rest of them, these are expensive. They're often not going, they're likely not going to give the farmer any profit, while the other strategies potentially can give a profit to the farmer. And the other, like the lower strategies are just for really intensive farms that have a market, that have consumers that want to pay the extra price for a product that has lower emissions or government regulations where the farms can do it. I don't see it practic like this is not a good solution for Africa and often these, except for these three strategies um, that have the little grass on it, they are for intensive systems because you need to mix it continuously into the diet. If the cow goes out grazing, then you can't really give them this. Um, now I need to go to see one back. I, I mixed up the slides. The other thing, when we're looking at animal production, I think I wanted to make this quite clear, is um, we're not looking. So this shows the emissions per, per kilogram fat and protein color, um, corrected milk on the y-axis and down on the x-axis you see the production of milk of the cow per year. So we have it from 1,000 to, to 9,000. And you see that the, the emissions per kilogram milk after 2,000 kilograms of milk per year, there's really no difference in emission intensity. So I'm not asking to go like have a cow producing 40 liters a day because that's not going to give us any gain in emissions. If we can move the cow that produce maybe three, three kilograms a day, and they can produce six, we're in a great shape. Like this is, I, it's reachable. It's not um, something that is too difficult to reach if you do proper feed management. Now, this is more about the social dimension of adaptation tracking. Um, 
these are the countries that have all committed to adaptation. This is where my colleagues in ILRI actually work in. But I think for, for what we're doing, we need to pay attention to the adaptation at the same time. So it's many countries that are there, but we really don't have um, international reporting. There's not a reporting framework in the or tracking. There's nothing we can use. I know they're, they're coming up with something by the end of the year. Um, so then there will be a framework that can be useful and, but it probably needs to be adapted. Then it's not, I'm not sure if my colleagues are online, they, if there are questions, I will check uh, later in this regards, and then we can maybe ask them directly online. And then there's so, a social and police, uh, policy interaction. Um, often there's a lot of money for mitigation, but we don't put a much, lot of, uh, of research into the adaptation. And we really should bring these two research areas together. And the adaptation also, um, the social differentiation and local adaptation. Um, the adaptation options shaped by non-climate factors, um, and they're not out like the adaptation options are also not always accessible for everybody. So we need, we just need to work on the farm as well and with farmers. Um, so one part that they're doing is they work with pioneer farmers and farm adaptation practices. And I think that's where we should start with where we're mitigating. So a pioneer farmer would be a farmer you see who's doing, who's doing better than their peers. And they may just have um, adapted some some technology that help them to to better. So on farm adaptation practices that they have looked at is there is modern sheep fattening in Ethiopia, um, shift in hair composition towards more small uh, small ruminants. This is a, also a national strategy of Ethiopia um, and management. Uh, methods. This is from Uganda. Feed storage preservation, diversified fodder crops. This is Kenya. Is really making sure you can feed your animal, or breeding for resilience and productivity. So even though this is what my colleagues work on, these are all adaptation strategies. They're at the same mitigation practices because these I know from from a common, even just common sense, but from researcher working on this topic, this will reduce my emission intensity because it will make my animal to be better. So we sh that's, and these are things that are already on the farm. These are things we can scale because what these farmers can do and what my hope is because we, we need to have a transformation on the ground that they have an approach from the producer perspective. So it's not some top down. We're not telling them what to do. We already have somebody doing something and their neighbors see what they're doing. And so it can be embedded within a wider systematic transformation of the rural livelihoods and we can partner with these producers because they are also important for us the data and they are also often open to to try new technologies and we have some citizen science which is an important approach and the other thing is that they these producers if they take ownership for for their community and want their community to be better they, they will be agents of change. They, they should be training their farmers because nobody has enough extension agents on the ground to, um, to train all their farmers in none of the, our countries. So if we get farmers that do something different and they share it with their community and they tell us where they need some training so they can further share it to their communities. This is where I think we can actually have some transformation. And with this, I just want to go to my key takeaway uh, points. So from um, just wrapping up basically what I said from um, African contributes to 17% of global food system emissions. The capacity for tracking mitigation and adaptation does not match the, the NDC ambitions at this point. Um, we do need to quantify the mitigation and adaptation strategies that are available for African systems because this isn't done yet. There needs to be data collected. Uh, and we need more research progress on um, the livestock mitigation and adaptation because it, it doesn't, um, it falls short of what our NDC commitments are. And <clears throat> there are effective strategies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 
but not many are applicable for the African continent and have been quantified at this point. And we have these pioneer farmers that are already applying techniques that are adaptation strategies with mitigation co-benefits. Cool and that can be easily, more, much more easily be taken to scale than if we come up with something new and we want farmers to do something they're not already doing. And they, pioneer farmers really should be encouraged from our extension agents to, to get a voice in their community and train their community. And I think the key that, that we get mitigation adaptation done is really that we all need to collaborate. So it's like me working with our social scientists more and making sure that even while we're still taking numbers, change is already happening on the ground because we do know, I don't need science or a scientific study to know if a farmer can appropriately feed their cattle, that this will reduce the overall emissions per product because we know we're not losing what we've already stuck into a cow. So with that, I look forward to any questions and comments and critiques and hope we have a really, really nice discussion. And before, um, I also want to, we do have a conference in 2025 in Nairobi in Kenya, which is the um, International Greenhouse Gas Co um, Animal Co Agriculture Conference. I'm the chair and, and BBK is the co-chair. And we really want African to contribute to this. It's the first time this, this international conference, the first time it comes to Africa. So I really need your input because we need to, to turn the focus of that conference to what is needed for us and really make hurt more like the, what has been done in Europe and in the US is not necessarily applicable to us because people don't understand their good intentions often, but then don't know the systems on the ground. Um, so I would be more than happy if you want to contribute in a committee or something and help us, please just send me an email or Vivica and, and reach out. Um, that would be great to hear from you. So please. Um, any questions, critics, comments? Just as an introduction, as Kofi takes the floor, um, he uh, holds a PhD in agroenvironmental engineering from the Kwame Nkrumah University, Science of te and Technology. Uh, and his work focused on quantification of greenhouse gas emissions from inland valley smallholder rice cultivation systems in southern Ghana. So we really have uh, somebody who has uh, dedicated his uh, studies on the subject. And uh, we welcome Kofi Boateng uh, to present the paper. Welcome. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Yes. Thank you um, very much. So um, I'm Kofi Boatin, and just before I, I start, I want to know if there are our brothers from Nigeria here. Anybody here? <laughs> Nobody. From Nigeria? Good. Have you tasted our jollof? Have you tasted the Ghanaian jollof yet? You haven't? <laughs> Good. So, so for those who don't understand, there's a jollof war going between Ghana and Nigeria. And I wanted to make sure that he's tasted ours before he leaves for Nigeria. Well, so um, from yesterday, from our sessions that we've had, one thing has been very clear, the lack of capacity in handling these issues. And we are talking about CSCs, Climate Smart Agriculture. And collaborations are key if we are to be able to scale these initiatives that are developed. And I want to use this presentation, a very short presentation, to highlight how international collaborations can build our capacity. And I'm going to use myself as an example and highlight how important collaborations are to um, developing the capacity to enhance climate smart agriculture. I, I use this, okay. 
So I got about maybe seven slides. So this is the outline. So I'll just show how it began for me, the capacity gap that was identified, the GRE, how the uh, capacity building initiatives has brought me here. And I'll zoom in on the Cliffgrass program, which is a very important capacity building program by the GRE. And then a little bit on the capacity building and the network that is enhancing climate smart agriculture. So the beginning, my background is in agriculture. So in 2015, I thought about, okay, so what are you going to do? Um, and knowing, going to the farm with my grandparents at a young age, I know how important agriculture is to our economy. I mean, in fact, 90% of our production here is smallholder based. So it's a very critical sector for, for the country and most of the sub region. Now, climate change is such a key issue that affects our smallholder farmers. And the question of adaptation and mitigation comes up very often. Do we adapt or do we mitigate? For me, I think it is the different sides of the same coin. For instance, in rice, some of the strategies that have been done to mitigate have adaptation co benefits. For instance, we are improving variety, variety improvement, short lived varieties. They emit less when they are short lived because 90% of methane emissions goes through the rice. So the shorter it stays on the field, the less methane it emits. And it is also being adapted to drought, for instance. So I think the discussion should be what really works in reducing our emission levels. If in doing that, we adapt as well. It's, it's the same bottom line. So I, I'll, I'll focus on my <laughs> presentation now. So I decided to focus on sustainable rice production uh, our, our brother from MOFA indicated how difficult it was for somebody to do work on quantifying rice emissions. And it's true. It was very difficult when I started trying to measure um, emissions from our smallholder farmers. So I would go on to the capacity gap. I realized that there were very few experts locally to actually guide you in even designing your experiments. Very difficult. So it got to a stage that maybe you should find something else to do because, <laughs> because it's not working. Because it's not working. So I'll, come, I'll go on to that, what, what I did to scale that gap in my slides that comes after this one. Another gap is technical infrastructure. Very difficult to get it locally. For rice emissions, you need your GC, your gas chromatograph. In 2017, when there was a need for me to get a GC to analyze my gas samples, I looked around. There are some GCs, but they are not equipped to do the kind of analysis that uh, I'm supposed to do. So it's a very difficult challenge. And you are very alone in this venture because you don't have so many people doing it to share your experiences, to share uh, what worked for you, so that I try it also. So that was also a very serious um, gap. So when this happens, when these things happen, there's a shift in the focus. Let me focus on something that I can easily do. Let me focus on something that I can get help on when I need it. So that is a real challenge. And for us in the sub-region where it is so important that we build capacity and focus our energies on developing mitigation adaptation strategies. If the capacity development is curtailed because of these factors, then it becomes very difficult to to, to make progress. So then comes in the GRE. 
so yesterday there was a confusion about what GRM is in Ghana. It's not a Ghana Revenue Authority. <laughs> Nobody's going to get taxes here. <laughs> so it's a um, Global Research Alliance. So currently, the Global Research Alliance has 66 member countries. And I, I understand Ghana was the first um, signatory to, to this uh, network. And there's a major focus on developing countries to help them to quantify their emissions, to develop strategies that can lead to low emissions agricultural systems. And there are four broad networks or sectors that the GRA focuses on. We have the Paddy Rice Research Group, which I have benefited immensely from, and the Livestock Research Group, the Croplands, and Integrative uh, Research Group. So these are made up of experts across the globe that look out for opportunities to transfer the knowledge that they have acquired over the years to young early career researchers. Now the Cliffgrass program, which I'm a proud um, recipient uh, in 2018, the second cohort. So this is a program that supports PhD uh, students from developing countries to build their capacity on measurement. So this actually, in my, in my, in my um, quest to find help, I came across this program. And I was like, this is so well suited for what I'm doing. And it is for this that I was able to actually complete my PhD. Because when I got a fellowship, I was um, invited to the US to uh, partner the USDA ARS uh, in Pendleton, Oregon, where they do emissions research. So a good opportunity for me to learn at first hand how to use your GC, how to, on the field, set up your experiment. And I, I'll quickly add this. Before I went, there are so many resources that the GRA has developed that I relied on to set up my experiment with the chambers. So I did direct measurement of greenhouse gases on the rice field. So I used these resources to develop my chambers, my basis, to set up my experiment on the field and actually to collect data, to collect gas samples. So what was remaining was how do you analyze those samples that you've collected? Now, even if the GC is available, the technical expertise to really do a good work in analyzing it was a difficulty. So this program offered me the opportunity to send my samples to the US to, to analyze it. And I got my data from here and came to complete my PhD. And so far from 2017, over 100 people like myself have benefited from this um, program and it's still ongoing. So if you are hearing me online or you're here, look out for these opportunities because they are really helpful and they are game changers in our quest to build capacity. And 64 people from Africa, 64% uh, people, from, uh, people from Africa has, have actually benefited from this program, the highest across the world. And so if you're online and um, you have opportunities at your institutes to host somebody, please, the email here, if you send that to them, they will respond to you. And then you can host somebody to build their capacity for us to be able to develop uh, agriculture in a sustainable way. So the capacity building and the network. So what has happened to me is that now I have peers all around the world that we collaborate on research in low emissions. And you have lifelong coaches and mentors that support you and guide you in developing these uh, skills that is so much needed. And there are also resources for data and analysis. If you have difficulties in analyzing your data, there are resources that can help you do that. And for me, the key thing has been the peer support. Now you get to find people who are like you doing the same thing. And that really helps in, in your career development. So I would end here 
Yeah, I was just saying the GRIA is simply a network of governments that are interested in um, increasing food security and at, at the same time reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So we've got these triple aims that we always want to address. Enhanced livelihoods, enhanced productivity, and reduced GHG emissions. So how do we do this? We bring countries together to increase cooperation in research activities so that we help reduce emission intensity of agriculture production systems. So uh, we bring nations or governments and they are associated research institutions like NARIS together with a direct link to processes such as the um, nationally determined contributions NDCs. Within the GRA, we've got um, four key research groups. We've got a research group which just deals with issues to do with paddy rice and research. And uh, I'm glad that um, Senegal is one of the countries leading this research group. We've got another research group on um, uh, livestock research, another one on croplands, and there is another one on integrative research. That one just deals with cross-cutting issues. As you could see, We've got a membership of uh, 66 um, countries worldwide and um, 17 from Africa with Ghana in the lead. Yeah, so within Africa, we've been working, of course, strengthening partnerships. We've been conducting some uh, collaborative research, uh, capacity strengthening. I think um, coffee has provided a very uh, practical example of what we, 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 we do. There are other um, opportunities in, in terms of um, uh, scholarships, uh, some of which probably I will, we can have time to talk about even at master's level and also um, uh, PhD level and also for senior or early career scientists. And we are also investing in equipment. Um, um, I know there are people that have been talking about um, how do we measure this? How do we do that? We need um, um, equipment to do that. We have that as the fourth component of our African um, strategy. So we do not work in isolation. We've got a lot of partners, including um, within Africa. And uh, we are here being hosted by FARA. FARA is uh, one of the key uh, institutions that we are working with within Africa. And let me just say that um, even as an individual researcher, you are free to participate in um, these um, uh, research networks. Yep. So back to our topic. If um, um, you have any other questions about the GRA, please, we are here. We can um, have a conversation over a cup of coffee or, or tea. Scaling up. I'm sure what we've been hearing through this conference and why we've been called is that there is a need which has been articulated by various or maybe a multitude of um, research papers, they need to scale up, they need to advance. What is the meaning of this? Is it just a buzzword that, um, especially as researchers, we are always talking about um, or wanting just something new to talk about? How do we understand and how do we approach this? So what I just did is just to look at a few 
academic papers that have been um, uh, produced in the past um, maybe um, 10 years or so and look at what messages those papers have been bringing out as regards to what we need to do to advance. So in case you miss everything that I, I'm saying today, please don't just forget this. My key message for this presentation is that viable climate smart agricultural technologies, practices, uh, policy instruments already exist. Scaling up, however, would require well-proven uh, partnerships and policies that provide the right enabling environment guided by a strong evidence base which has been generated over the years and where necessary this should be supported through demonstration of specific benefits for both mitigation and adaptation. I want to just emphasize both adaptation and mitigation. And if you could just focus on the highlighted weights because these are the weights that encompass my presentation today. So just in terms of grammar, when we are talking about scaling up, we're just looking at um, increasing the socioeconomic impact from a small to a large scale of coverage. Uh, other ways that have been used are uh, ways like lubrication, the spread or um, adaptation of uh, techniques, ideas, approaches, or just increasing the scale or the scope of impact. So we are just talking about the means and also the ends. How do we just improve on that? I've been looking at some papers and there is a convergency on three key issues within most of the academic papers. I know I want to formulate this just as a conversation with you. I don't want to get into academics. Um, that's not my strength. I just like talking. Um, if at all we need to scale up, there are three things that are critical. Better design of ice, climate smart initiatives. Demonstration of successful initiatives. Um, my key word there is demonstration. And then lastly, an en enabling environment. I will expand on these uh, three um, points when I look at um, what is missing within this. From most of the papers that I've been reading on climate smart agriculture, adaptation or mitigation, one key thing or theme comes out, data. There is a paucity of data and surprisingly, it's not just maybe very technical data. Sometimes it's even data on program information, finance, the financial structure of the practices. By that, I mean what you put in, in terms of finance and what you get out of it. You won't uh, you will hardly find that information. And even on the contextual factors that affect that intervention, most of this information, especially within Sub-Saharan Africa, is rarely documented. So the lack of data remains a key challenge to scaling up climate smart agriculture. The second one, or maybe before I go to the second one, I just wanted to state that without reliable information and facing this reality as um, researchers, policymakers, if we cannot face this and accept that um, this is an, a key issue, then the solutions that we are going to pro propose 
could definitely be very narrow in scope because we are proposing solutions from a very uninformed base. The second is in terms of demonstration of the benefits. We've been crying about people not embracing some um, activities, especially we blame it on the farmers. And sometimes we also blame it on the uh, private sector. They are able to invest. But if we as researchers cannot demonstrate the effectiveness of an intervention, that's just how cost effective, how gender responsive, especially in, uh, within the African context, how scalable it is. Financial institutions or the private sector are moved by um, sometimes it's profit and sometimes they're quite risk averse. They will not invest in something that is not demonstrable. I'll move to the next component, which we have all been talking about, um, coordination. You may say that, oh no, this, probably this is exaggerated. I've been working with a number of uh, countries within uh, Africa, research institutions, um, with, sometimes within the same country, researchers within the same universities. And the situation has been in most cases is that sometimes the right hand does not know what the left hand is doing. Yeah. And, you know, we want to um, collaborate at a very high level, but these are little things that are affecting us. I've had some proposals, maybe by virtue of my um, uh, position within the, the GRA. Sometimes proposals from the same university proposing the same thing. Yeah, it's very true. So if we, we need to address these realities where we know what the other hand is doing, otherwise we'll continue duplicating efforts and we've got very generous donors. They'll be just funding the same things over and over again. At some table I was, I was sitting this week, somebody was telling me, ah, this thing, I think I heard about it when I was at uh, primary school. It's, now they are, in a, they are working in a research institution. That's the same research which is being conducted. Maybe God help us. <laughs> so we just need to strengthen those. Um, linkages, we need probably at project level, even at local farmers level, even at national governments, it's all the probably three tiers of government everywhere. Then uh, related to this, I just wanted to talk about also the multiple, um, we, sometimes we want to use similar stuff or similar uh, instruments, if it's being on regulatory or financial instrument, we think that is the only thing which can sort of uh, solve the problem. But when you are dealing with an issue like climate change, there is no one single solution. So you need to be quite broad in scope and uh, sometimes just even think outside the box, involve a lot of instruments. It could be financial, it could be um, regulatory or, or so, just multiple with the instruments is what I would recommend. And four, critical issue, synergies between adaptation and mitigation. We've already had this conversation, so I don't want to um, jump into the fire here. Um, let's look at even our um, policy or even just the fiscal separation which is there. 
Um, what I'm providing here is just um, a study which was done by the OECD in 2021. They were looking at the money that are being spent, being spent on adaptation and mitigation. You can see, let's take for example, 2019, we are only talking about 20 billion US dollar being used on adaptation. Look at um, uh, mitigation. That is going to tell you a story about the fiscal separation that we have created. In terms of our policies also, I think Claudia just showed us something where very few African countries have integrated mitigation in our policies. We just say, oh no, it's something that we are not responsible for, or it's something that we shouldn't be doing. But to be honest, we are already doing mitigation. By, um, I'll, I'll give us a, a simple example. Say the farmers have um, stopped maybe this, um, or have just gone for zero, is it zero tillage? Yeah. They are not really disturbing the soil and the soil is able to do what? To hold the carbon. That is not just adaptation. There is mitigation. There are mitigation core benefits because the carbon is not escaping the soil. So we are doing mitigation. So we have kind of created a separation, even in terms of geographies. We've got the north, global north, with more focus on mitigation, and the global south on uh, adaptation. And sometimes I just have a feeling that these um, um, divisions and such conversations are counterproductive. So the key things that I'm just talking about today, or what most of the papers, I know they'll give a number of reasons, but all these reasons converge on these five points. Um, the data gap, demonstration, involvement of multiple actors and instruments, synergies between adaptation and mitigation, and better institutional structures and enabling environments. In conclusion, I just want to say, it is not necessary to wait for new and enhanced technology or instruments that may come into play. We already have the technologies. All we need to do is to act now. Thank you. Um, I think the only person that we haven't seen or heard from in this panel is um, uh, Dr. Kofi Atia. I'll just give you the mic to introduce yourself. Uh, to the panel and uh, just um, a few um, remarks on um, what you think about uh, partnerships within uh, climate smart agriculture. Thank you so much. Um, as um, Dr. Akim has already mentioned, um, my name is uh, Kofi Atia from the University of Cape Coast. And I, we do a lot of work together with um, CSIR in various aspects of the food systems. And maybe uh, if I'm given the opportunity to make a, a, a brief presentation, I would, but probably I would have to take this opportunity to mention to you about collaborations that um, we have engaged as a university uh, as a research uh, university research institution and other international collaborative linkage. Basically, what we have done uh, regarding climate smart agriculture from the soil science perspective is to try and increase the effort at increasing soil organic carbon. Because we've noticed that um, a lot of the fertility parameters are hinged around depleting soil organic carbon. So one of the technologies that we have um, been investigating 
intensively has to do with um, increasing soil organic carbon and coming out with climate smart technologies for the cocoa sector because it's one of Ghana's leading, um, what I would say, foreign exchange earner. And it is also at the heart of policy because you can never talk about climate and take cocoa out. Recently, the country was involved in a, a bit of a policy dialogue about whether we have to do extensification in order to increase cocoa output, mm. or we stay at the same level, but increase yields outcomes through intensification processes. So there was the discussions on um, shading trees and emission control measures. And I think we've gone a long way uh, with our international partners such as FAO and to, to come out with a global soil partnership. And I think certain frameworks have been built and are still being built. And there are some policy level decisions that still need to be taken. And I think from there, uh, we need to build more capacities mm. and bridge the linkages. Excellent. One of the things we notice is about what I call research marketing. Mm. The scientists will come out with the findings that, oh, this intervention reduced greenhouse gas by this. It reduced greenhouse by that. But I think what key thing we saw is missing is about packaging and communicating. And I think the marketers are good in this. Mm. Yes, and I think that is where we still also have to talk a little bit more because if the farmer will ever adopt any technology, yeah. he or she needs to see it. And sometimes some of the outcomes are not so tangible. But how do we make it tangible in the eyes of the farmer for some of this adoption? And to paint the picture within the short to medium in the, to the long term. So I think we have a lot of work to do when it comes to how we communicate some of these findings and making it more tangible to the end user. Thank you. And uh, I think that leads me to, to the next question. Um, um, uh, Claudia, um, in terms of um, what we need to do to build capacity and to ensure that um, um, the correct messages reach the farmers, what is your institution doing about that? And uh, are there any capacity development um, programs that ERI is uh, undertaking to build capacity, not just at uh, farmer level, but also at, um, say, PhD level. So, Thank you. Um, from ILRI site, um, we do build capacity. We're training students. So we have various students in the laboratory. We do have uh, researchers on the science side, which is Laura Kramer, who is uh, on the mitigation agenda, our main person. Um, we also train um, trainers usually. Um, so the, the work that Birgit Habermann is doing with the pioneer farmers. Um, so there is training on that side. So, so we do, because Ilri is quite big and we are in our silos. I've been only there since a year and a half. So I don't have the whole overview of what Ilri is all doing because we have a genetics department. We have, we have so many different departments. But like for me, for the work that we are doing right now, um, the social scientists that are within our, our program, um, sustainable livestock systems that work on adaptation, we just like trying to start to work with each other because there was no, before I came, there was no collaboration between the two programs, even between the scientists. So this needs to be established, but a lot of this is also, I, I bring it to funders because I've been talking to funders and it's like, you know, if you tell us we need to work together and that's the only, like you only give us money when we do that, then this will happen. So I think there's also like, it needs to come from us, but also the funders need to realize we cannot just go one direction. So Ilri is big and they do a lot. I don't know everything we do, but we do have capacity building on, on level, different levels and policy engagements as well. Wow. Yeah, let's, um, 
just uh, build on that maybe and get uh, the Ghanaian uh, perspective. Um, um, Dr. Kwe, um, what is your institution doing? Are there any uh, interventions that your institution is doing just to enhance uh, partnerships and uh, in research and development? Okay, so my institution is not a funding uh, institution. We receive funding, but um, <laughs> we, yeah, receive, I... we receive funding for uh, implementation. Um, though we, we have been told to generate at least 30% of what we need, putting everything together, which is a big challenge. Uh, but what, what we do in terms of collaborative uh, research, um, because we interface between the policymakers and the researchers, most of our activities, we create the enabling environment. We create the platforms for bringing people together because we believe in talking, but science is about people. You cannot do science without people. When others have their labs, we have our platforms for engagement. And so what our focus is, is then now, what are the techniques? What are the upcoming and the new technologies that could be used to facilitate engagement? Um, now we do a lot of engagement online and also coming up with some new facilities. But the bottom line is that in all of these, I keep focusing on the, those are the grassroots, the, the, those that are supposed to use our technologies. And so if the farmer is not enabled to, to join online with some of these engagements, how then do you reach out to them? But the good news is also that they also have some social media platforms where we could communicate. So we need to do that. We need to bring, and I, I like this idea about science communication. We need to bring our messages, messages down, package it in a form and use the media that could reach out to those at the, at the, at the, at the bottom. The thing is also that how do we get these are busy, you know, policymakers to engage with? Mm. And so, Again, in what form? What would be appealing to them? So these are the these are the, the kinds of things that you know we are supposed to battle our minds with and come up with very sharp and focused solutions to some of these issues. Thank you, thank you, Doc. Um, Coffee. Um, I want to say that your story is um, quite amazing in in terms of um, how um, you have. Um, not only benefited, but also contributed to um, uh, capacity development uh, in Ghana and now working at the international level within your institution. So how can this be accelerated so that more and more uh, African researchers like yourself benefit from such interventions? Thank you, Akim. So I mean, the, the first thing is obviously to position yourself to take advantage of these opportunities when they arrive. That, that's, that's the first key thing. <laughs> and secondly, you know, there's a need for you to look at the bigger picture. Why, why do I want to do this? And that will inform the commitment with which you would approach that opportunity. And there's the need for whoever wants to take advantage to also be critical and look out for these opportunities. I, I told you when I started my, my, my work, there was, if, if you don't look closely and if you don't look well, you will not find these opportunities. And um, our friend from Ufa indicated that somebody started working on on, on a similar project, but I had to abandon it. Mm. I was in the same you know, situation, but, and networks are very key also here. Your networks would help you to identify these opportunities. And at the uh, hub level, uh, the global meeting hub level now, uh, we are like seven months uh, since this uh, initiation. And now at the strategy level, definitely, 
um, we we are looking to partner with institutions to for them to bring into their strategy capacity building. So that is also one thing that is being built into the strategy on how the hub funds uh, its partners. So it's something that is very critical. And all through these sessions, that is what we have. We have. We have the the the, the theme that has run through is capacity development. So it is something that is going to be in the strategy. Yeah. Thank you. I will just take um, one question from um, the screen and then um, open it to the audience. If you've got a question, yeah, I can see that already there's a hand there, but uh, probably yeah, another hand. Thank you. Let's just take this. Um, um, Thanks. Uh, a question uh, for Claudia. You said African global greenhouse gas contribution from food systems is 17%, but don't you think this is somewhat exaggerated? The other one you mentioned that starting 2024, all countries should submit their um, national uh, inventories, but to what extent is this mandatory? <laughs> so to the first part of the question, I took that from a research paper. Um, I don't think there is a question there. Um, it's 17% and Africa is a big country continent. There's a lot of agriculture happening and food system where food is produced and there are lots of people to be fed. So I don't think that's exaggerated. When you look at Asia, who has a higher population, they contribute 40%, right? Um, in the grand perspective, yes, Europe and the US do pollute a lot, but they're not as many people. I think that's also where's the difference. Um, what's the second question? I think the second one was just on the... Oh, on the, on the commitment. NDC is being mandatory. As far as I understand, yes, but yeah. I'm not a political scientist. So if anybody is like, I'm, I'm from, from education, I'm an animal nutritionist. Mm. So, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. from what I've read, yes, it's mandatory, especially if you have NDCs. Yes. Um, yeah. But then yeah. if you do tier one, you may be putting yourself into the out and you, you really cannot show you should have tier two to, to really show your commitments if you're working on them. Yeah, if uh, your country is party to the Paris Agreement, then um, we need to provide those reports. Thank you. Uh, my name is Palas. I work for the uh, CSR Soros Institute. Uh, thank you to our panel. Uh, my question is simple. You know, we are all trying to foster, like Madam uh, Chris said, Dr. Dr. Chris said, we're all trying to uh, foster partnerships. And we've seen here from yesterday and today that that is uh, something that we are really, really lacking. What, what, what do we say are the greatest of barriers to uh, collaboration and partnership? Is it an issue of trust? Trust with the uh, use of the funds? Trust with the security of the data. <laughs> I hope the question makes sense anyway. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we have trust issues. But if if I should just speak like a lay person, uh, it is not poverty uh, mentality. You know, try trying to grab it all alone and becoming or the famous one, or the, you know, the best scientists, the best experts and all of that. But you, you cannot do it and become the best if you don't open up. And that, um, and you cannot do it all alone. It's, it's, it's never done. It's never done. It has, it, it borders on so many interests. And what is it that you, you, you alone has that nobody has? It's also not said anywhere. And so um, if you realize it's more common with this part of the world, and it has to do with the resources, and you think that that is the, the most efficient way of 
But if you don't share, it's you are being. You are, it's, it's simply like that. So um, I think that there's trust issues. It's also issues to do with you know security of you have the data you have. Because some people, when you want to collaborate before you are aware, the person is even publishing without you. And then it becomes a... so if, if if we learn the skill of doing it and understanding each other, it's not too much about the science, it's, it's about the skill of the people's skill of working with people and understanding the the the, the, the conditions of working with people. You have to deal with it's 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 an open field. You you can't do it alone. I um, wanted to add some things, um, even an issue with the Global Research Alliance used to, to have. Before I came to Africa, I worked in Latin America, and we built a, a network for Latin American researchers working in greenhouse gas emissions. And they, even though all of them were part of the Global Research Alliance, they didn't feel like they were part of the Global Research Alliance, because a lot of the projects and the, the collaborations was based on, on successful uh, leveraging of funding. Now, all the funds never included Latin America, so Europeans and um, Americans could work together, but Latin America couldn't even get funds. So there were these researchers down in Latin America wanting to be part, but they, they couldn't because you cannot do, like, you can only do so much without funding. And that was really key. And uh, Hayden, who used to be the special representative from um, GRA, like I had him involved when we did that. And that actually made a change because for the last Aeronet call, which was on circularity and greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture, the GRA put 100,000 in for African countries, for Latin American countries to make sure we get this North-South collaboration. So. I do think it's a funding issue um, with sharing of data from my side. I came, when I started my position, my, my, my coworker, she was always very, very careful about and is our data. I wasn't looking at it that way, but I have myself encountered now that sometimes somebody comes from Europe or whatever, it's like, oh, look, they have all this data. And instead of doing something which I would find you country a publication, um, but it wouldn't do something that, that will help the country. So I myself have become more cautious and, and um, careful about this. And I do think key to any collaboration is that you really sit at the table before you do anything and you make clear what your expectations are, what's going to be done and what the other parties uh, expectations are and you really line that out clearly and you reflex you ask the person what do you think i want to make sure they understand because i think a lot of times it's also misunderstanding and you can write that down on paper to say like look we, we did agree on this that doesn't mean maybe bad things won't happen to you but i think just having a, a really clear conversation beforehand and and putting it down and rephrasing it can really help to make sure that we're really, because sometimes you say something and I say something to you and you think like something very different, what I just said, S especially if you come from different cultural backgrounds. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think I introduced myself earlier. I don't, may not need to introduce myself. <laughs> um, on this uh, data sharing, I just want to also add that uh, the CGS system has to be thinking of uh, development code of ethics and how data is being collected and how it is being published. Most of the time, the CGS system will work with the national research uh, institutes. And if you have to publish with a country without a national or a, maybe those who are on the ground, it doesn't help. You cannot just harvest data on somewhere and you publish and those who collect the data don't even know anything about it. It is something that we have to look at it as a research code of ethics so that people do not go about doing things that are not helping our system. But what I want to actually ask is, uh, Kofi, you benefited from the capacity building and we are also called to be responsible. So, 
want to know whether you are building their capacity in your, in your school so that those people will also add up to what you have benefited. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I think it's a very relevant question. I mean, um, they said to whom much is given, much, much is expected. Definitely, yes. Um, so from my presentation, I made mention that there are others that are benefiting from the skills that are acquired at a PhD level and some of the master's level. And so there's a PhD student that I help. He's working on uh, cocoa systems as well. So coming back and the skills are acquired, he approached me and said, this is what he wanted to do. So um, I, came, I, I found it a moral obligation to, to support him and to also show him how to probably improve on what I had started. So that process is there and my doors have always been open to this. And I make people know that I'm able to help in this way. That is key because if people don't know how you can help them, they cannot approach you to do that. So I make sure that that visibility is there for people to know and when they come, there's no hesitation at all in, in, in doing that. So you are, rest assured that scale is being passed on to others to also benefit. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, um, once again, Franklin Avodno, um, I work at Adima Research Institute of the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research. Um, Dr. Kwe, uh, you made mention of um, engaging policy so that um, some of the recommendations can be passed and then implemented. But um, sometimes, or very often in Ghana, when you engage policy and you hear the politicians or their representatives giving us a lot of assurance that uh, whatever we have put across, they are very important, they are going to implement them. And then after that, you now chase them to implement whatever they have promised. And they become very difficult to access. So in that case, <laughs> what would you suggest as a more effective way of getting? Is it that um, the recommendations, they are not evidence-based enough? In which case, the politicians should be frank with us. Or is it that the politicians have their own agenda? Okay. <laughs> I don't know. How, how do we make things more effective? Yeah, so um, yes, they have agenda and you also have an agenda. But the thing is that the policy work cannot be done without advocacy. And so there's a need to push and push and push until you have results. And that is how it's. Yeah, so you, you have pass on recommendation and then you sit in animal research and you expect that the recommendations will speak for itself. No, you constantly have to invest in them. And sometimes you have to use the people. You, you do your stakeholder mapping and you know the influences. You have to use them. You have to have champions, people who can. You cannot just you know, talk to the president. You know the people who can teach the president's heart. The thing is also that they also have so many on their plate. Everybody is running in this part of our world. And, and that is crazy. The researchers are running. They are doing all kinds of things. And that is why sometimes we don't even have the time to share. It's not because you don't want to share, but you've not created time. You were drawing up your design. You didn't create time for dissemination. And you didn't also allocate resources for that. Okay? You cannot do anything without, you know, resources. And when I say resources, sometimes our minds are about money. No, it's not just about money. Resources is about the capacities that we build and the way to do things effectively, the soft ones. Mm. You also don't need to go to the classroom to learn the soft skills. Please, if you are a researcher, you know the kinds of skills that you, 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 you have to know how to talk. The research cannot speak for itself. You, know, you have to know how to, if you cannot do that, the science communicator to help. One other thing that you can use to touch the politicians, our strategic partners, you have to be mm. strategic about it. And so in designing 
your research, you make them involved. If, 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 and please, there the are differences between those who are the policymakers and then the politicians. The pure politicians, they don't understand a lot of things. But the, the technocrats that make, you know, the decisions and try to educate them. Because for the politics, the politics and the policies, I think there is a clear difference between the two. Yeah, so I think we can have a lot of conversation, but we are running too much. That's why I, I think that we need to keep, to, you know, pay attention then to the little details that will actually help us. Thank you. Uh, one last question before we... Okay, hello everyone. I think this question has somewhat been asked Oh, sorry. My name is Nasiru Taura. Yeah, I'm from uh, Boma. Um, so this question has been asked about uh, privacy of data and things like that. But I want to direct redirect the question to Atia. Um, yeah, I like the questions, um, the points you made earlier. Um, I, I was listening to a talk um, from someone from World Intellectual Property Organization uh, that talked about uh, this idea of uh, traditional knowledge or, or indigenous knowledge sometimes being misappropriated. Uh, so just, just to say that, um, could that be one of the reasons that's making people sometimes skeptical to, to, to collaborate and, and also um, like we don't tend to have very strong uh, protection around this kind of indigenous or traditional knowledge. Is there any way do you think if I'm operating as a farmer, a local farmer, uh, with some of my traditional knowledge, I seek collaboration, but I'm a bit skeptical, uh, what would be like the best way possible? Any thoughts you have? Thank you very much. I think I would make an attempt to answer this question in the best possible way. Uh, I remember early this year, and I think probably late last year, um, quite world-renowned scientists were moving from what they call the helicopter research. I'm sure quite a number of us here have heard about it, where we have experts from Europe and elsewhere who just fly in, gather information, and probably during the policy formulation or problem formulation, they did it involve the grassroots. Uh, and it goes back to what I said earlier. It's about what is in there for the farmer, the end user. It's about the communication. And I think maybe I'll have to hit it there again. Is anytime we develop our programs with action plans for any research collaboration, I think we need to involve the extension agencies the knowledge communicators. We don't want to be seen to know everything. And sometimes it's part of the reason why we keep data to our chest and we are unable to share is because we think solutions to problems don't lie in multidisciplinary. We want to see problem. It's, it's akin to uh, this icon, which is on social media where somebody climbs an elephant. And depending on where he or she touches, they say, no, this is a dog, uh, this is a horse. But then if we move and get the perspective of everyone on board, I think we own the problem, we find a solution that will be owned by everybody. Then everybody don't feel cheated at certain part of the research collaboration. So I believe it's about how certain donor agencies leave out some of these calls that please, you would have to include certain uh, indicators that could be a little bit binding in such course. Thank you very much. Thank you. To what Kofi has said, I mean, we, we are talking about CSCs and what this discussion is directed, the, the core people, the end users are the people, you know, at the grassroots. And I don't know if, it's an oversight or I don't know, but most of the time you realize that these people's inputs are not really considered. And so they don't own whatever you bring. And if 
there's no ownership of the technology or innovation that you are bringing. There's no way it's going to be sustainable. So they are critical actors that um, need to be considered from the scratch to, to be able to make these innovations sustainable. And just to touch a little bit also on the science policy nexus where the source problem, a lot of science done, but it's not translating into policy. I think it's both ways. I think sometimes the science, we spread too thin. That we are doing so much at a time. We are not focusing on what is the most important thing that we have to do to catch the attention of the politician who needs to get votes in four years mm. to win power again. Mm. His interest is his power, but he has his eyes must be turned to something that attracts said, No, this has to be done regardless of my quest for power. If that is not done, uh, we are going to come here and say, guys, we'll come here five years later and discuss the same things again. There's a need for us to catch the attention, create a niche and occupy that niche. And look, these are the solutions we are looking for. If we look here, if we go here, we are able to get those solutions to apply them. Wow. Ask briefly, because I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, the panelists are now, when the panelists become the, asking the questions, then we know that there's trouble coming. Yeah. Yes. Then uh, the, the people this side will be answering. And yeah, then the chair is going to be in deep problem, especially that time is um, not with us. It's already 12 um, o'clock now. Yeah. So probably the. Um, um, especially for our online um, uh, participants. I think we really need to thank them and just give them a clap for staying with us. Thank you very much. We do not take your, uh, your time for, for granted. We appreciate you joining, joining us. I would just invite uh, Dr. Segandao to just um, uh, give a vote of thanks on behalf of um, um, the, the GRA and the other institutions that have gathered. I know this conversation will continue, but let's continue it um, in the corridors. Eh? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can be here? Okay. So thank you very much. Um, one thank you to all uh, participants here in the, at the room and the online. And on behalf of the all team of the uh, New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas Research Center. I would like to thank you very, very, uh, very warmly about your participation and your contribution. But we have to keep in mind that uh, the cake uh, messages is very important. It's time to act. It's very important. And to do that, we have to start uh, with uh, uh, somewhere with the available data in order to have a baseline of what we are going to do in the, in the future. It's very important to, to do that. Uh, many people are talking about the default uh, uh, methodology that you use. Yes, there are very uh, uh, amount of, in terms of uncertainty, but we have to bring on, on the table why this value are very uh, uh, are very uncertain for our for our for our agricultural system, and for doing that, we need to be uh, more active in terms of scientific collaboration. It's very important. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, much longer than that. Um, just to say thank you on behalf of all the team of uh, the New Zealand Agricultural Greenhouse Gas uh, Centre. Thank you.